Good morning, West Portal, and a happy Thanksgiving. It was awesome to hear all those things that we are thankful for, and I, I would add on to them. I'm thankful for you. I, I'm thankful uh, that we get to be part of this together. I am thankful for uh, a Thanksgiving meal. I got to have stuffing and mashed potatoes, turkey, Brussels sprouts, some peach pie. I'm thankful for that all. I'm thankful for the weather outside, right? This is a beautiful thing. I mean, we know Britain said the W word. Don't say that. Come on, brother. And I'm, uh, I'm thankful for this book. Uh, this book that shows us who our God is and who he calls us to be. And this morning we're in Ephesians chapter 3. And if you have your Bible, you can open it up. Ephesians chapter 3. And this really is Paul talking about grace. The grace that he has received. Three times in these first 13 verses, Paul mentions this grace. In verse 2, he says, God's grace that was given to me. Verse 7, the gift of God's grace which was given me. And verse 8, this grace was given. Grace. Grace, God's grace. It had come into Paul's life. And it met Paul where he was at. Because Paul, well, he was opposed to Jesus. And he was a persecutor of the church. He hated Jesus and he wanted to stomp out the whole movement. And, and we have Paul's uh, testimony in Acts chapter 26. Uh, if you take a, uh, a left in your Bible, you can keep your finger there on, on, on chapter 3. But I want you to hear Paul's story, Paul's testimony. Chapter 26, it starts at verse 9. I, uh, I hear your page is still turning there. I'll, I'll start. I myself was convinced that I ought to do many things in opposing the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And I did so in Jerusalem. I not only locked up many of the saints in prison after receiving authority from the chief priests, but when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. I punished them often in all the synagogues, and I tried to make them blaspheme. And in raging fury against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. In this connection, I journeyed to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests. At midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven, brighter than the sun that shone around me and those who journeyed with me. And when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew language, Saulus, Saulus, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goats. And I said, who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and stand up on your feet. I have appeared to you for this purpose. To appoint you as a servant and witness to the things in which you have seen me and those which I will appear to you. I'll deliver you from your people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God. That they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. That's Paul's story, that he was opposed to Jesus, ran into Jesus, maybe Jesus ran into him, and now he's sold out for Jesus. And I don't know where you are at this morning on that spectrum, but God's grace is available. This is the touch of grace that is available to each of us. And so we want to look at this in this uh, in, in Ephesians chapter 3. And actually it's this digression that Paul has. Take, take a look. Ephesians chapter 3. He says, For this reason I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, on behalf of you Gentiles. And then there's a couple dashes. And then again verse 14. For this reason 
I bow my knee. See, Paul is about to enter into prayer here. He's, he's talked about this great mystery, and he's about to enter prayer, but then something catches his attention. Maybe his, uh, he, he hears the chains rattle. Maybe a, a guard sneezes, but whatever it is, he, he digresses into where he has been and how God has walked with him. He digresses into telling us about God's grace what God's grace is, and what God's grace does. So those are going to be our headings for this morning. And the first is what God's grace is. And it's this mystery revealed. We'll look down verse 1. For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation as I have written briefly. Okay, there's this word mystery. That's what this grace is. It's this mystery revealed. Now, when we, in English, we hear this word mystery, we think of Sherlock Holmes or something that is baffling. Something that you can uh, never understand. For some, you might think the mystery is love. Now, uh, a couple uh, weeks ago, I had my friend, my new friend, uh, Isaac, come visit me in my office. And uh, we talked for a little bit, and then Isaac left my office, and he went out into the foyer, and uh, Rosanna was there. And so Isaac introduced himself to Rosanna, and uh, Rosanna said, yeah, I'm uh, James's wife. And all I heard from my office was this big laugh. Ho, 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 ho. Isaac couldn't believe that she was married to me. <laughs> and it might be a mystery, like why she would choose somebody like me. This And love is blindness. It can be a mystery. But that's not the kind of mystery that Paul is talking about here. You see, in Greek, a, a mystery is, is a, a truth. It's a truth that wasn't known, but is made known. It's a, a truth revealed. The lid is lifted off. Ta-da! And you see what it is. That's what mystery is. A truth that was previously unknown, but now made known. And it's made known by this revelation, by God lifting off the lid, by God revealing it. That's what he says there in verse 3. Um, uh, verse 3. Da, da, da. The mystery made known to me by revelation. And, and it's kind of, uh, it's like, um, there's no way they would have ever figured it out on their own. You see, uh, it's like my, uh, my friend, my best friend's dog when we were growing up. You, you would never guess this dog's name. You could sit here all day and uh, we, could, we could have these guesses, but you'd never guess the dog's name. <laughs> Wrinkles? No, no. Good guess. George? No. Chubbs? No. <laughs> What time? Noodle. Noodle. Oh, no, you'll never get... The, na the dog's name was Chi. Chi. Uh, it's a cute little Sharpie. And uh, that's what this dog's name was. But it's to be a mystery unless you heard it. I think it was short for lychee, which uh, his family loved to eat. But it's this uh, mystery. And verse 4, he says, When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles, uh, holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. See, this mystery wasn't known before. To the sons of men. This is another word for uh, people. It wasn't known by the, the sons of men uh, previously. Abraham didn't know it. Um, David didn't know it. Moses didn't know it. Solomon didn't know it. Isaiah didn't know it. Mal uh, Malachi, he didn't know it either. None of these former prophets knew it. But it was revealed in this new age, revealed again by the Spirit to the apostles and prophets. 
And Paul says, you never would have guessed it, but here it is. He doesn't leave us in suspense. He says, let me tell you, the mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. That's the mystery. That now in Jesus, the Jewish Messiah, we Gentiles have been welcomed in to the privilege and the promise of being God's family and being a part of what God has been doing through the family of Abraham and Sarah. That's the mystery. We no longer have to become Jews in order to get in on this. But because of Jesus, we can get in on this. Now, there were hints toward this mystery in, uh, in Abraham's calling. Right back at Genesis 12, verse 3. I'll bless you, and in you all the families of earth shall be blessed. A clue in Isaiah, God says about his servant, it's too light a thing that you should be my servant to rise up, raise up the tribes of Jacob and to bring back the preserved of Israel. Too small a thing. I will make you a light for the nations that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. That God is doing a new thing. That he's bringing the Gentiles in. To the church. And this is what, he's, uh, what Paul has, has, has mentioned here. Look back at uh, Ephesians uh, chapter 2. Verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus. You who were once far off. That's us Gentiles. Have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For Jesus himself is our peace. Who has brought us both. Jew and Gentile. Who has made us both. Excuse me. One, and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God and in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. That's the mystery. Jew and Gentile, are brought together in Jesus. And it's a new creation. There's no longer Jew. No longer Gentile. But Jesus people. And this hostility with God has been removed. And the hostility with one another. It's not only this, this right relationship that we have with God. But he has put the hostility to death. Between one another. This is uh, what there was hostility. There was hostility between Jews and Gentiles. New Testament scholar William Barclay, he writes, The Jews had an immense contempt for the Gentiles. They said that the Gentiles were created by God to be fuel for the fires of hell. That God loved only Israel of all the nations that he had made. It was not even lawful to render help to a Gentile woman in childbirth, for that would be to bring another Gentile into the world. The barrier between the Jew and the Gentile was absolute. If a Jew married a Gentile, the funeral of that Jew was carried out. There was hostility. And it went both ways. Cicero, the philosopher, he wrote that Greeks say all men are divided into two classes. Greeks and barbarians. You're either a Greek or you're less. Subhuman. See, there was this hostility. There was racism. A and racism isn't uh, for a particular group in a particular time. It's something that infects the whole human race. It's not just the oppressed that, have, uh, that are racist or, or the oppressors. It's not just the Jews or the Gentiles. Not just the First Nations or the settlers, not just the whites or the blacks, not just the Hutu or the Tutsi, not just the Ukrainians or the Russians, but racism infects us all. And Jesus has come to end the hostility, to put it to death. That's this mystery. 
that we would have never guessed on our own, not in a million years, that Jesus is creating a new humanity in himself. That's what he wants to do. And that really um, hit home for me. One time, uh, it was a, a service, a Remembrance Day service, and um, we were we had this call to worship in which people were were talking Isaiah chapter two in their native tongue. Isaiah chapter two is let us go up to the mountain of the Lord. And I heard it uh, out of one ear. I heard this middle-aged woman say it in French. And then on the other side, I heard this older gentleman say it in German. And in toward the back, I heard uh, a babushka say it in Russian. And all of a sudden, it hit me that these people who 60, 70 years ago would have been on opposite sides, who would have been hating one another, not trusting one another, killing one another, we're now brought together in Christ, praising God. Can you imagine that? I have a dream that my four young children will grow up in a nation in which they are not judged by the color of their skin, but the content of the character. Martin Luther King getting in on the mystery. Can you imagine a, a family in Ephesus, a, a Gentile family and a Jewish family who have nothing to do with one another, hate one another, stay away from one another, but both families come to Jesus. And now they sit together. They praise God together. They break bread together. Their children play together. This is the mystery this is the gospel of what God wants to do. Not only in us individually, but in us as a family. The fulfillment of Judaism. That Gentiles are brought in. That God's chosen people for this world include Jews and Palestinians and Egyptians and Burundi, and Cameroon, and Bangladesh, and Chinese, and Canadian. That's the mystery. And that kind of talk can get a man thrown into jail. That's what happened to Paul. They hated him for that. They despised him and they said they distrusted him. They said he can't trust Paul. He's anti-Semitic. He hates the Jews. You can't trust Paul. He, he's a misogynist. He hates women. You can't trust Paul. He's homophobic. He hates gays. You can't trust Paul. He's obsessed with guilt. You can't trust Paul. He corrupted Jesus' teachings. You can't trust Paul. We hear that still today. And let me ask you, West Portal. Do you trust Paul? That this was the grace that was given to him. For us. Or do you refuse to trust him? Do you grab onto some parts of Paul, but say, you know what? I, this part about husbands and wives, I can't trust Paul. This part about marriage being between one man and one woman for life, I can't trust Paul. This part about sex being uh, no sex outside of uh, marriage, I can't trust Paul. This part about radical generosity, that Paul doesn't just ask for a tenth. That God doesn't ask for a tenth, but he wants the whole. He wants all of you. You can't trust Paul. That the only way that your friends, your family, your neighbors will come to know Jesus is if you tell them about Jesus. Otherwise, they'll never come to know that salvation. You can't trust Paul. Do you trust Paul? Do you trust that this revelation was given to him? See, this is the mystery. That God has come to save not only us as individuals, but us as a community. And to bring us together. To destroy the hostility that we have between God and humanity and with uh, uh, humans and one another. That's the mystery. That's grace. That's what God's grace is. And now what God's grace does, well, it changes the way that we see. 
It gives us new sight. You see that right here, uh, verse 7. It, it changes the way we see ourselves. Paul says, verse 7, Of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given me by the working of his power. I was made a minister. Now this word minister is the Greek word diakonos, deacon, right? A servant. Somebody who waits on tables. Paul says, you know, this Pharisee of Pharisees says, I am a a table waiter for you, Gentiles. That's how he sees himself because of grace and so much more. Look at verse 8. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given. Though I am the very least of all the saints. Paul doesn't come in strutting him himself saying, you know, guess what's got two thumbs? Is God's gift to this congregation and wrapped in good looks? This guy. That's not what Paul does. He says, I am the least of the saints. I am the least of those who have come to know Jesus. What is this? Is this... False humility? Is it self-loathing? Neither. Paul sees himself in light of God's grace and it changes the way that he sees. You can see Paul's progression in this grace. Um, in AD 55, AD 55, Paul writes his letter to the, the church in Corinth and he says, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 9, For I am the least of the apostles. You know, there's leaders in the church, and Paul sees himself, leaders, I'm the least of them. All right? Uh, A.D. 62, he writes this letter to the, the people in Ephesus. I am the least, the leastest, actually, of the, of the saints. There's leaders in the church, there's those other followers of Jesus, and then there's me, the least in the church. And then in A.D. 66, towards the end of his life, he writes to his dear friend Timothy. 1 Timothy 1 Verse 15, the saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. Leaders, church, sinners, Paul. That's the way he sees himself because of grace. That's what grace does. It changes the way we see ourselves. So let me ask you. How do you see yourself? Do you have these grace glasses on? Now for some of you. Uh, you may think you're all that in a bag of chips. <laughs> Listen. You need to see yourself in light of God's grace. I am what I am. By God's grace. And what do I have that I have not received? That's for some. But I think there's many more who are here that are, see themselves as unlovable, as nothing, as worthless. Um, there's some that say, James, if you knew my secret, where I have been, what I've done, what's been done to me, what my family is about, you'd escort me right out of here. And I'm here to say that Jesus knows. He knows it all. And he is so confident in his grace that he calls you to follow him. It's not your record to lean on, good or bad, but his grace. How do you see yourself? This grace, it changes us the way we see ourselves. His irresistible grace. And it changes the way we see the church. Uh, verse 8. Uh, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles 
the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plain mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things. That's what Paul's calling it, to bring to light. That when the gospel goes out, it brings light. That the prince of darkness, the prince of this age, Satan keeps people in darkness and in blindness. And when the gospel is spoken, the light dawns and they can see. They can see that they can have a new relationship with God, but that's not all. This plain, the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things. Verse 10, so that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. That's what is happening here. That not only is God um, displaying his manifold witness, his um, uh, wisdom, his great power, his great grace by bringing us to himself, but the ability to bring us together, that's his grace. And did you see who it was assigned for? The heavenlies. The powers and authorities. This is those spiritual beings, especially those that are opposed to Jesus. See, the church is on display for the heavenlies so that they will see. And you hear these two things about spiritual beings. Number one, that they're watching. That they see what's going on in this world. And that your actions matter. And number two, they don't know everything. That God is revealing to, his, to them his power. That's what's happening in the church. God's revelation of what he is able to do. And these demons see that and they shudder. See, they see that no matter how hard they work, that it's only a matter of time before Jesus is able to bring all things under his head. He, they see that they are on the wrong side of history. And church, sometimes... Um, we hear about the CBC and the Fox going out to find what's happening in this world. To go to, to Gaza, to go to uh, Capitol Hill, to find out what's happening in the world. Paul says they should be coming here to watch your life, to watch my life, to watch our lives. That this is where history is going. Toward the reconciliation of all things because of Jesus' great grace. He is able to pull this together. That's who we are. That's the church. I love the way that uh, Pastor uh, John Piper puts it. He says the church of Jesus Christ is the most important institution in the world. The assembly of the redeemed, the company of the saints, the children of God are more significant in world history than any other group, organization, or nation. The United States of America compares to the church of Jesus Christ like a speck of dust compares to the sun. The drama of international relations compares to the mission of the church like a kindergartner riddle compares to Hamlet or King Lear. And all pomp of May Day and Red Square and the pageantry of New Year's in Pasadena fade into formless gray against the splendor of the Bride of Christ. The gates of Hades, the powers of death, will prevail against every institution but one, the church. Lift up your eyes, O Christians. You belong to a society that will never cease, to the apple of God's eye, to the eternal and cosmic church of our Lord Jesus Christ. How do you see the church? See, I hear from many folks, I love Jesus. It's a church I can't stand. The institution is corrupt. That it's gone sideways. And they may not say that visibly uh, or vocally. But they live it out. I don't want to go to small group tonight. You know what? The boys got hockey this morning. What, it, what does it matter if I'm there anyways? 
Paul's view of the church is that, is that the heavenlies are watching. That this, what we do together, pushes toward world history, toward its final conclusion. That's the grace glasses to see the church. And that's what Paul is willing to suffer for, right? In, uh, at the end of this passage, verse 13, So I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is, for, which is your glory. Paul says, don't lose heart. I'm suffering, you will too, but it's working out your glory. And what I love most about this is this Pharisee of Pharisees, this Jew of Jews, his heart breaks for these Gentiles. That's what grace does. It changes our vision. So as Portal, let me close by, uh, by asking you uh, a question. Uh, Paul starts off this passage by saying, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus. And Paul was a prisoner in Rome. He was a prisoner of Nero, historically. But that's not what he writes here. He writes, I'm a prisoner of Christ Jesus. See, long before Nero had him, Jesus did. Jesus had his heart. Jesus had his life. He was at the disposal of Jesus. Paul was captive to Jesus. So let me ask you. Are you captive to Jesus? Does he have your life? If you're living for Jesus, he does. But if you're living for your kids, for your legacy, for the weekend, he doesn't. Does Jesus have your heart? Is your heart captive to Jesus? If he is the most precious thing in your life, then he does. But if you're more concerned about having control or being comfortable and being part of the in crowd or the top dog, then he doesn't. West Portal, there is more grace for us. For us as individuals and for us as a people. As the body of Christ. Let's push into that. Let's receive this grace. And let's be the church of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, let me pray. You, you know what? Worship team, you can come forward too while I'm praying here. And Father, Father, we are thankful. We are thankful for what you have done. That what you have done, nobody else could do. That we, though we were your enemies, you sent Jesus to give his life for us that we might become your children. That we might be incorporated into your family. That we might know you as our father. And Lord, uh, we are thankful for your grace. And we are sorry for the different ways in which we spurn it in which we turn away from it, in which we set our priorities or our goals, in the ways that we refuse to welcome uh, the other. Lord, the way that we try to build our own kingdoms. We ask you to have mercy on us as a people. That the West Portal, we might be your people for this world. And Father, I ask you, to shine your light. If there are those here. Who don't know you yet Jesus. That you would open up their eyes. That they might be able to see you. They might be released from the power of Satan. To the power of God. You're able to do this Lord. So we pray this in your name. Amen.